In this video, I'm going to detail basic items that I believe everyone should own. I've got a lot of friends and family and business associates that are anything but preppers, but they do recognize the need to prepare. And I get asked all the time by these same people, well, what are the bare minimum items they should have in case of a disaster? Earthquakes, fires, tornadoes, hurricanes, these things can happen. So in this video, I'm going to try to answer that question. Additionally, you can think of these items as kind of a simple insurance policy. You can buy them, you can put them in a tote, and then you can store them away in case you need them. And many of these items you may already have. Now, while preparing this video, I had six criteria for the items that I wanted to present. They needed to be affordable. You could buy them and store them away for years. They require no skill to use. They would make a big difference after disaster. They would keep you alive for three days until outside help would hopefully come. And if you continue on your journey of preparedness, all of these items are things that would still be very useful. So if any time during this video you want to check out any of the items that I discuss, I'll post links in the description and comment section below to everything we cover. Also, if you have any feedback or ideals or if I miss something, please comment below as well as I enjoy getting your feedback. Now, one quick note. If you store these items away, put them in a cool, dark place like the back of your closet. Don't put them in, let's say, your garage where the temperatures may get very hot or cold. And when it comes to food items and water, heat and light will shorten their lifespan. Okay, so here are the items. Water containers. The average person needs one gallon of water per person per day. You're only going to survive on average for about three days without water. So for each person, at a minimum, you'd want three gallons of water stored. So let's say you have a family of five. You would want, in that case, 15 gallons of water, three times five. You'll use this water for drinking and sanitation. And when I first started getting serious about preparedness years ago, I got these five and seven gallon containers. They're relatively affordable. They don't take up a lot of space. And they're transportable if there were disaster that were to force me to flee. When shopping these containers, there's a couple of things you want to pay attention to. Don't get clear water containers. These can develop growth over time. Because they're clear, light can come in. You want a container that's food grade quality and dark like these. Now, on the bottom of each of these, you're going to see HDPE2, which is commonly used for long-term food and water stores. So when you go to shop for these, always look for that indicator on that label on the actual container. Now, additionally, you also want to consider the thickness. This one holds more water, but the material is very thin, and so you can't stack these on top of each other. Now, this one, on the other hand, is made with a much thicker material, and so you can stack, I believe, up to three on these. So based on the amount of space that you have at your house, you really have to weigh the pros and cons of which one makes the most sense. I've got a mixture of both of these around my house. Food. For this, you want at least a three-day supply of non-perishable food or food that doesn't require refrigeration for each person. Now, I advise people on a few things. Number one is to get items that don't require much in the way of cooking and cleaning. If, if it doesn't require any cooking and cleaning, that's a preferable direction. Uh, for example, after a disaster, a fuel source may not be available and cleanup would be difficult, especially with a limited supply of water. And so you want to, secondly, buy items that can be stored for years. Again, we're taking the approach with this video of just buying things and forgetting them. And you want to base how much food you store away based on the number of people that you have that need food for three days. And let me just give you an example. The average male adult consumes, give or take, about 2,200 calories a day. Females will be different and children will be different. So base those numbers based on the individuals in your home. Here are some items that you can purchase that will meet this criteria. Uh, you have things on the market like survival bars. These are very high in calories and basically they taste like honey wafers. And again, these can, I believe, if I check the expiration date on these, I want to say they store for roughly about five years. And so, I don't know, you probably will get tired of eating these day in and day out, but they'll provide you with the basic calories. Now, most of you will probably have some type of canned food around the house. And again, these will store for a certain amount of time. Uh, you know, some may store for a couple of years, some may a little, you know, a little longer depending on how you store them. But again, if you have some of these and you just want to split off some and put them into the tote with the other ones, at least you know that they're ready. 
Another item, and this is an MRE, this is a meal ready to eat. This is what the military typically uses when they're out in the field. These are self-contained food you know, uh, setups that basically have high calories and they've got a, a heater built in to heat up uh, the food whenever a soldier wants a warm meal. And so these are great options as well uh, because you, know, you can get a lot of different types of MREs with different flavors. And again, it requires no additional input, no fuel, no water, anything. They're just ready to pull out of the bag and eat. Now, the last one is freeze-dry food. And this is one of my personal favorites. These can last up to 25 years if they're properly stored. Now, the only downside is that they do require that you heat some water. You have to pour it inside, but again, it's its own little self-contained, you know, a setup where you just pour the hot water in, let it sit for about eight minutes, and you've got a meal that's ready to go. As you can see, I've got a mixture of all of these in our home. So determine which one's the best for you. A lot of you will probably decide based on price. Uh, when I get people started, I usually just say, get some of these, throw them back of a corner, cheap, easy, they'll do the job. But if you want a little variety, here are some of the options. No radio. Now these can pick up the typical AM and FM bands, but also the NOAA weather network, which broadcasts emergency information. So let's say a disaster hits your area and internet's down, your cell phone's not able to get a reception. You still wanna be able to tune in and find out what's going on around you and get updates. Now devices like this, they often will have a flashlight built in. Uh, it's got a hand crank here on the front of it. And the beauty of the hand crank is not only will it power this device, but you can plug in through the USB connections here on the back, different things like your cell phone. And so while it will take a while to hand crank it, at least we'll get the job done. Now, something like this, the reason I recommend it is because it serves several different purposes and would be quite useful. Flashlight. Now, I know with the previous item, the hand crank radio, it had a flashlight, but I wouldn't really rely upon that as my sole light source. Think of that as a backup source. Now, this flashlight right here, uh, I think we got a four pack of these for, I don't remember how much, it wasn't much money at, at Costco. They're pretty affordable and it's made by Duracell. It's, uh, you know, I think a thousand lumens. So it's a pretty solid flashlight. Now, if you're gonna store something like this, you wanna keep the batteries separate. Why is that? Well, how many times have you opened up an electronic device? It's not working, so you open up the battery cover and lo and behold, the batteries have corroded and then it just destroys the terminals that connect to the batteries. So what I do is I just keep the batteries separate. So again, if we're thinking about, hey, let's throw, th th uh, throw things into a tote, put them away, you can get something like, you know, these batteries, I think they're good for 12 years. So that's, you know, again, what we talked about at the beginning of the video, a lot of the food items are about five years. So that's plenty of time after several years of pulling out and rotate them if you have to. Now, additionally, we, and this is just kind of an extra bonus option here, is we keep this uh, battery daddy in our laundry room. And so what we do is whenever, as you can see, the batteries are a little low here, we'll just periodically pull it out and fill it back up. And so we kind of keep the batteries fresh and rotate. So I always know what this is. It's in our laundry room. So if you do, for whatever reason, keep items outside of the primary tote that you've stored away in the back of the closet, make sure you know that you have it in a place that it's always going to be because nothing would be worse if the lights were to go out and you're fumbling around for batteries. So those are your options when it comes to a light source. First aid kit. These are good for treating minor issues such as cuts, burns, or various pain issues. And again, these are not for advanced situations, but will handle most of the minor stuff that you may run into. Now, one of the things I always tell people is in addition to getting a first aid kit, make sure you get a tourniquet. If for whatever reason someone has a severe laceration and they begin to bleed out, seconds matter in that moment. And having a tourniquet on hand would be critical. Again, you may not be able to you know, call the ambulance or you may not be able to get to a hospital in time. So always think about that. Now, when it comes to tourniquets, there's uh, this one is called a cat tourniquet. And there's a company called NAR or North American Rescue that sells this. So if you go on Amazon, you're gonna see a hundred that will look just like this, but they're knockoffs. And if you've seen on YouTube, a lot of people will buy the knockoffs, they'll crank them down that, you know, like you do with a tourniquet and they'll break because it's just, it's poorly made. This is the only one that I would recommend. I have no affiliate relationship with them, but they're just known through the industry. Whistle. In the context of emergency purpose, whistles serve to signal for help. If there was any kind of disaster and whatever reason communications were down, you could go out and obviously blow on something like this and get attention very quickly. So if you need it, again, some kind of emergency situation, this could be critical. N95 mask. These are designed to help filter contaminated air. 
such as fire or during a pandemic. Now, where I live, we have fire on almost an annual basis, and so we just are used to having these on standby. Uh, the air quality drops significantly when we have a lot of smoke in our area, so we just have to wear these out, out of necessity. Uh, if there were any type of pandemic in the future that necessitated having something like this, a high mortality rate type of uh, pathogen, I would wanna have these as we all witnessed a few years ago. Uh, everybody started rushing and you could not find the N95s there for a period of time. They limited these just to the medical staff. And so having a, a good you know, amount of stored up for every single family member, one or two, uh, could be very, very useful. Plastic sheeting and duct tape. These are designed to help you shelter in place. During or after a disaster, if your windows were to get busted out, say for example, and you've got to cover them up, uh, having the you know sheeting and the tape would be extremely useful. Imagine if you have a leaking roof during a heavy rainstorm, or if there was any type of severe pandemic that forced you inside and you've got to cover up the vents and the windows and anywhere inside where air may be exchanged. On the extreme end of things, potential nuclear war with nuclear fallout. These are not issues that are uh, out of the realm of possibility, I'll put it that way. So on that note, this could serve a lot of different purposes to provide you shelter if you have to stay inside your house. Personal sanitation. For this, we just need to think of some simple things. Again, moist towelettes, uh, hand sanitizers, garbage bags to get rid of waste, whether that's you know food or human waste. Think about it, if the sewage goes down after a disaster, you may have to resort to something like this in a bucket. So having these simple items on hand, already having enough in place, would be very useful for sanitation. Wrench or pliers. After a disaster, the ability to turn off your utilities would be critical. Say for example, you don't want gas coming into your house. Maybe there's a leak after an earthquake, and so you wanna be able to go out and shut off that line. Maybe you have a leak inside and you need to be able to turn off the water outside. So remember, the thing, if you haven't really messed with a wrench much, righty tighty, lefty loosey. Just keep that in your head. So every time you turn to the right, you're tightening it up. And every time you're turning to the left, you're loosening it up. One of the things to remember, for example, on your gas line, let's say the pipe is like this. This is a gas pipe. And there's a valve that you can see right here. If you were to take this wrench and turn it, that means you've now blocked off the passage of gas with that pipe. Whenever it's turned in line with the pipe, it allows the flow. Same with the water. So anytime you have a situation where you need to shut off the utilities, something like this would be extremely important. And again, I would encourage you, like all these items, to store it away. And you may say, well, I've already got one of these in a toolkit. What we're trying to do is go, or rather reduce, the need to run around and find things. I've talked to friends after, uh, a friend of mine was in Snowmageddon in Texas several years ago, and that was the thing that he told me. The first thing is he forgot where half the items were in his house, or rather he was scrambling to find things. He couldn't, in the middle of the night, or in the middle of the dark, he was having a hard time finding items. So again, even if you just get a simple five or six dollar one at Home Depot, just store it away so you always, always, always know where these items are. Manual can opener. If you can see a trend here, it's that we're trying to get away from things that require electricity. We just wanna go with simple tools. Most of us think, well, I'll just use the can opener under my you know, cabinets. Well, if that's powered by electricity, it's not gonna work. So you're gonna need this for things like opening up your cans of food, obviously. Now, most will probably already have this, but again, as I pointed out in the previous point, keep a spare, even if it's a cheap one, in a place that you always know where it's at. So whatever reason, if you can't find the primary, you at least always have the backup. Local maps. How many of us, if we're just being honest, are hooked on our GPS? Uh, I hate to admit this, but there's times where I'll be driving somewhere <laughs> not even paying attention or know where I'm at half the time because I'm just listening to the GPS direct me. And then I'll look up and I'm like, oh yeah, shoot, I forgot I'm here. But after disaster, you may not know or you need to get to a certain place and you may not know how to get there without the GPS. I mean, if networks are down and it's not available for whatever reason, you need to be able to navigate around. So my advice is, is don't just go on you know, Amazon or someplace and just get a generic map for California or wherever you live. Get one specific to your city. And you can typically get these at AAA. This is where I got mine. It has my particular city where I live at. And again, it's, it's not something I can just get online. It has all of the streets and everything I would need to know if for whatever reason I had to navigate around in my area. Cell phone charger backup battery. 
There's so many times where I'll go someplace and I just run out of power on my phone. And I always keep this usually in my backpack or my car because again, it just allows me to quickly plug in and charge. Now, the hand crank radio that we mentioned earlier, it did have that ability that you could plug in a USB to charge up the, uh, your you know, phone or whatever you plug into it. But additionally, having a small battery like this could be useful. It can extend out the life of your cell phone which as we know in this day and age, it pretty much can do everything for us, assuming power, or rather the towers are still operational and we can still connect to it. But having this backup power would be extremely useful. Live straw. Now a live straw is a simple water filter. All you have to do is pop the cap off and then you just pull through this other end with your mouth and you can filter out the water. Now these are extremely easy to use. They're very common, very affordable, and they can make a huge difference. And again, I know earlier we talked about having our water backup, but if for whatever reason we run out of water and you have to somehow drink water, maybe a pond or lake nearby, this could mean literally the difference between life and death. Books. Now, I've done a video on my channel about survival books that I would recommend, and I'll post a link to it up in the cards above. But for the point of this video, I just kind of boiled it down to just a few that I think would be something that most people would want to have on hand. Now, the first one is the Medical Survival Handbook. Why did I start with this one? You may say, well, I'm not a physician, and that's the point. This book is designed for non-medical personnel to handle most of the situations that you may encounter. I only bring this one up because if the internet's down, power's down, or whatever, having that vital information that should someone get injured in my family, we know what to do. I've had uh, this couple on my channel several times, Dr. Joe Alton and Nurse Amy. Uh, they're incredible resources within this community, and I believe this is their fourth edition. They've kept improving these books. I've had several friends that are physicians look over these, and they were very impressed as far as from a basic understanding level for common folk like you and me. Now, other books that you may want to consider is the SES Survival Guide. It's a little advanced in some ways, but it has a lot of topics and discussions on handling some basic survival situations. And again, just one of those things that if the internet's down and you're like, well, what do we do here? Well, you might be able to get that information on this book. And one other book is kind of, I would almost say a pared down, kind of more common folk <laughs> type of book for the rest of us is called Just In Case. And again, this is geared more toward non-survivalists like you would find in a book like this and it's more for just you know like hey here's someone that's going through a disaster what do i need to know how can i get to this situation and so again you might want to consider one of these books if information that you would typically get on the internet is no longer available now if you want to go beyond just the three days of survival being prepared i'll post a link here on the screen to a video entitled three months is all you need as a prepper it does a great job of breaking down the basics of building your level of preparedness to more than just the minimum which we cover in this video if you have any thoughts any feedback feel free to post it below and as always stay safe out there